My name is Larry Hale. I'll be your host this morning. And I want to just thank you for joining us in this next event in our Information Technology Category Emerging Technology Series. This half-day forum brings together government, IT security, subject matter experts who will share their knowledge, best practices, trends, and use cases. Share the agenda with you briefly this morning. We'll have opening remarks from Laura Stanton. We're honored to have a keynote from Maria Roth of OMB. And then we have two panels. Uh, as you can see here, security considerations in emerging technology and supply chain risk management in emerging technology. And uh, the event will be closed out this morning by Alan Hill. At this point, I'd like to introduce Laura Stanton, the Assistant Commissioner the Office of IT, Office of the Information Technology category in the in GSA's Federal Acquisition Service. The Federal Acquisition Service, your host this morning, provides buying platforms and acquisition services to federal, DOD, state, and local governments for a broad range of items from office supplies, motor vehicles, to information technology and telecommunications products and services. As Assistant Commissioner, Ms. Stanton manages the largest fee-for-service IT procurement and services operation in the U.S. government. Ms. Stanton leads a highly skilled and diverse workforce that manages more than 7,000 contracts, providing access to relevant and timely IT and telecommunications products and products, services, and solutions to defense and civilian agencies, as well as to state, local, and tribal governments. ITC facilitates more than $26 billion in annual government spend, supports 98% of federal agencies, and has provided nearly $2 billion in savings to its customers. With that, I'd like to introduce Laura Stanton. Thank you, Larry. Um, good morning, and every, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our fourth event in this Emerging Technology Series. We started these series to be able to talk more um, in depth about some of, the, some of the technologies that we see coming out. Um, over the last year, we've held events in artificial intelligence, 5G, and cloud migration. So, um, and I am thrilled today to have a chance to kick off today's cybersecurity event and introduce our keynote speaker. Cybersecurity is a timely topic. Over the past six months, we've seen dramatic changes in how we work. I think everyone, you know, if you're in a conversation chatting with anyone, you're going to hear their latest story about being on a video conference. We make jokes about the number of platforms that we use and that we spend our days staring at the glowing camera in our laptops. And meanwhile, while we're doing that and we've transitioned from to the, to the video conferences and the collaboration platforms, we've also transitioned our processes from paper to digital. It highlights how quickly our work life has adapted and evolved. Um, during this time. Correspondingly, our adoption of these new technologies for collaboration and productivity have also increased the need for heightened awareness and vigilance across agencies, companies, schools, and universities. We're adapting to these changes. We're continuing to adapt to these changes. And we also have continued urgency to protect our information and digital assets. That's what makes today's event so timely. This reality that we're in today has vastly increased the potential attack surface as enterprise perimeter defenses are opened up to accommodate this increased need for remote access. This underscores the need to employ the principles of zero trust architecture to include IT asset management, tailored access controls with strong authentication, and proactive cyber hygiene. Today, you'll be hearing from various subject matter experts who will share their knowledge and best practices in and around supply chain risk management and con security considerations pertaining to emerging technologies, such as artificial intelligence, 5G, Internet of Things, and cloud. Cybersecurity and supply chain risk management have been hot topics lately, especially as it relates to IT modernization and the rapidly changing IT environment. It's critical that we're staying up to date and continue to have dialogues about how to be proactive in identifying security risks and implementing strategies to maintain the integrity of these new emerging technologies. 
so that we can, main, we can access their benefits and remain secure at the same time. Another cybersecurity topic that we're going to be talking about is the Trusted Internet Connection, TIC 3.0 update. The TIC 3.0 update is still in progress and expands on the original initiative to drive security standards and leverage advances in technology to secure a wide spectrum of agency network architecture. This new version of TIC is highly iterative, which means that the guidance will better reflect modern processes and technological innovations compared to previous iterations of the program. TIC 3.0 recognizes shifts in modern cybersecurity and pushes agencies toward adoption while recognizing their challenges and constraints in modernizing IT infrastructure. GSA continues to work closely with the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, and industry partners to make sure that the contracts that we provide, especially the enterprise infrastructure solutions, um, align to the TIC 3.0 guidance. These activities are helped to establish solutions that federal agencies can use to securely connect to the internet and cloud services. I hope by the end of this event, you'll have gained some knowledge and key takeaways to apply and take back to your work. So I would, I am honored to also introduce our keynote speaker, Maria Rote. Maria is the Deputy Federal Chief Information Officer in the Office of Management and Budget and the Office of the Chief Information Officer. She came from the Small Business Administration where she was the CIO and has also served at the Department of Homeland Security and Department of Transportation in a number of technology leadership positions. Maria began her career in the United States Navy um, with data process as a data processing technician and later worked for the Navy in a variety of technology and engineering positions. She also spent time in the private sector um, and has before returning to the government. So with that, I want to say thank you, Maria, for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. And without further ado, let me pass it over to you. So good morning. Um, so I hope everyone is safe and healthy throughout this time of the pandemic. And thank you, Larry, Laura, and uh, the entire GSA team for inviting me. This morning's focus on security for emerging technologies is timely. Advances in artificial intelligence, computing, and wireless make technology faster and more reliable, but they come with cybersecurity threats. This year, as the federal government transitioned to telework, we saw the threat continue to accelerate. The federal government is already moving to digital first as it modernizes its systems. Agencies invested over the last several years in modern infrastructures and zero trust networks. The flexibility, security, and scalability of cloud-based solutions afforded us the ability to configure commercial platforms with reusable services. And this year, we saw innovation accelerate as agencies leveraged foundational capabilities already in place. Our investments in cybersecurity paid dividends against threat vectors, including phishing, scams, and malicious emails. The most recent FISMA report uh, that just came out reflects improvements in the areas of focus under the President's management agenda, and federal agency elements of the National Cybersecurity Strategy. There was an 8% overall decrease in incidents that demonstrates the progress made by agencies. Although attempts continue to increase, we are becoming more adept at detection and defense against adversaries. And agencies are making significant progress in managing risk. Focus efforts to secure mobile government mobile devices were successfully implemented across the entire federal government and were especially important in today's expanded telework environment. OMB will continue efforts to improve cybersecurity, including continued focus on digital identity and protection of high-value assets. When you talk about emerging technology, 5G is one of those. It's an overhaul of our networks and the conversion to a nearly all software-based network. There are vulnerabilities created in attaching billions of devices to the network, that Internet of Things. Cybersecurity must address the ecosystem of ecosystems and challenge our traditional assumptions about network security and the security of devices attached to the network. 
we must be prepared to counter software attacks, not only with people, but with software, artificial intelligence. And data is a key area that is foundational for advanced analytics, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Investments in data accelerated and enabled our ability to respond throughout the pandemic. Using technology tools and applying advanced analytics and AI informed and continues to inform decision making throughout the pandemic. The cloud greatly expanded our agency's ability to securely support the terabytes of data collection, data warehouses without investing in hardware. In 2019, OMB set the federal government's Identity Credential and Access Management, ICAM policy, and a lot of thought was put into defining an identity, that, that unique representation of a subject, like a person, a device, a non-person entity, or automated technology, and that's engaged in transaction involving at least one federal subject or resource. And it takes into account the federal enterprise identity or a public identity. An identity is the underpinning for managing risk posed by attempts to access federal resources by users and information systems. The pandemic highlighted how digital transactions are critical for the federal government to deliver on its mission. Agencies must have sound processes for authentication and access control to securely deliver their services and protect individuals' identity. The life cycle of a digital identity must be managed and we must ensure that automated technologies such as RPA and AI ensure that that digital identity is distinguishable, auditable, and consistently managed. This includes governance and mechanisms for updating and revoking and destroying credentials. And we want to improve that digital interaction with the American public. The security, trust, and safety of transactions with the public is critical to the federal government's digital service delivery. Agencies must manage the risk to services and public user data. The collection of PII should be limited to what is relevant and deemed reasonably necessary. And even as agencies are leading in artificial intelligence for sciences, engineering, modeling, and simulation, federal employees are doing basic AI research and developing the mathematical underpinnings. And AI is being applied in biomedical and many other areas, including cybersecurity. We are already using AI capabilities and cloud-based tools for cybersecurity. AI machine learning detects, defends against network intrusions, and this is beyond simple rules-based logic. AI built into cloud-based tools is already being used for enhanced threat intelligence and fraud and anomaly detection. We also know that AI and cybersecurity capabilities can be used against us. We are committed to mitigating supply chain risks to the federal government's IT and communications technology. Implementation of Section 889, I think you're going to talk about that a little bit later today, like all supply chain risk management requirements is a shared responsibility of agency officials representing information technology security, risk assessment, requirements, program and end user, and acquisition functions. And talking about emerging technologies, quantum computers, you know, they're a long way off from being able to break current encryption. But if and when large-scale quantum computers are ever built, they will be able to break many of the public key crypto systems currently in use. We are more than a decade from, quant from a quantum computer that can solve useful problems, and some engineers are predicting 20 or so years for large-scale quantum computers to break all the public key schemes already in place. Regardless of the exact time, we must begin now to prepare for information security systems to resist quantum computing. A significant effort will be required to develop, standardize, and deploy new post-quantum crypto systems. This transition needs to take place well before any large-scale quantum computers are built. And NIST is already planning for this transition and working on a process to develop new cryptography standards. Investments in long-term modernization are key to continuing to drive change across the federal government. 
There is a long-standing area of shared interest between Congress and the executive branch, and top priority areas include improving the cybersecurity posture of the federal government. The CIO identified the need to develop approaches to modernizing end-to-end -end processes that may require digital capability from state, local, tribal, and territories. These end-to-end -end processes cut horizontally and vertically through multiple levels of government. And these end-to-end -end processes, including data sharing, need security and privacy built in. So how does the federal government sustain long-term modernization, drive innovation, embrace emerging technologies, yet balance appropriate cybersecurity risk? Building in cybersecurity is imperative, but should not be a blocker to innovation and technology adoption. I have seen the value of investing in modern, scalable solutions firsthand, and how taking prudent risks, collaboration, brainstorming, and sharing ideas and concepts can drive change. We must do more to drive sustained long-term transformation and ensure digital first as we add value in service delivery. Building in security is paramount. So I want to thank you for your time this morning. And please enjoy the rest of this morning's lineup and session. It looks like a great morning. So again, thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much, Maria, for sharing those remarks with us and for teeing up the topics that the uh, panels will be taking up as we move forward this morning. Thank you so much for the um, poignant remarks. Uh, you're welcome. Point, I'd like, <laughs> thank you, Maria. At this point, I'd like to introduce Victoria Pilateri, who is leading our first panel on security and emerging technology. Victoria is a um, advisor for information system security at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, she focuses on information security and risk management and serves as a senior researcher for the Federal Information Security Modernization Act, FISMA, Implementation Project. Vicki has led research programs at Smart Grid Cybersecurity, Cyber Physical Systems Cybersecurity. She holds a master's in computer science from George Washington University and a bachelor's in electrical engineering from the University of Maryland. And Vicki is currently serving on detail to the IT security subcategory in GSA uh, in the IT category. So Vicki is moderating our panel today. I'll turn it over to you, Vicki, for uh, introducing your panelists. All right, thank you so much, Larry. I am delighted to join you all this morning to moderate this panel of experts who will be sharing their expertise on today's rapidly changing cybersecurity landscape in these emerging technology areas, 5G, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, and cloud and considerations for preparing to acquire these emerging technologies. If you think about this panel, I think we've hit all the major IT buzzwords in one subject, right? So it's going to be jam-packed and hopefully really informative to the audience. I'm looking forward to a great discussion with our panelists and ask that uh, participants engage by typing questions into the chat feature in Adobe Connect throughout the panel. We will have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of each panel. But you know, if you hear something and you have a question that you'd like to follow up on, pop it into the chat and we'll definitely get to it. Um, in case that your question doesn't get answered due to time constraints, our panelists have graciously shared their contact information visible on this slide uh, for, for follow-up. All right, so without any further ado, I'd really love to briefly introduce our panelists in alphabetical order. First and foremost, we have Sean Connolly, the TIC Program Manager and Senior Cloud Architect at the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. Second, we have Brian Conrad, FedRAMP Program Manager for Cybersecurity from our very own GSA. Next in the lineup, Kevin Gallo from the Office of Telecommunication Services. He's the Director of Solutions Development at GSA as well. And last but not least, we have Adam Grant, IP Modernization Centers of Excellence. Uh, he's the IP Infrastructure Optimization Lead also from GSA. So, uh, enough of me talking. Um, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to give their elevator pitch about themselves and their program areas, starting in reverse alphabetical order. Um, Adam, you're up first. 
Thank you very much, Victoria. Uh, thank you, Maria, for the fantastic introduction. Um, as mentioned, my name is Adam Grant. I am the uh, infrastructure optimization and cloud adoption lead for the GSA Centers of Excellence. The Centers of Excellence were created by the Office of American Innovation uh, to assist federal agencies across the government on their IT modernization uh, tasks. We are embedded with agencies across government in the areas of artificial intelligence, cloud adoption, contact center, customer experience, data analytics, and infrastructure optimization. We tend to work with them on identifying their own needs and then um, working with them to acquire resources, usually from the private sectors, to achieve their goals and accelerate their processes. Um, I've been with the center for about a year and a half, worked with about seven agencies. Uh, before that, I led infrastructure optimization efforts in the financial industry for about 15 years. Thank you very much. All right, Adam, what a great start. Uh, next up, Kevin. Hey, good morning. I, I'm Kevin Gell, the Director of Solutions Development for the Office of Telecommunications Services in the Information Technology category. And my team in Solutions Development provides technical subject matter expertise for our program. The largest focus is on Enterprise Infrastructure Solutions, or EIS, which will be the uh, predominant contract vehicle for the federal government to meet its telecommunications and related IT infrastructure needs. You know, so you, as you and your agencies are transitioning your networking and telecom from expiring contracts to EIS, it's a perfect time, you know, perfect opportunity to modernize your infrastructure. You know, and perhaps the biggest driver of modernization is the migration of workloads to the cloud, you know, one of our topics today. And that's dramatically changing the demand on the network and cybersecurity. You know, we in solutions development provide assistance to agencies in meeting those networking needs. You know, we see all the solicitations on EIS, so have a unique government-wide perspective, and we, we, we meet very regularly with industry also. We also leave the technical updates for our contract vehicles. For example, you know, we recently added software-defined wide area networking, or SD-WAN, to EIS. We're currently working on new services related to cybersecurity, in particular managed security services related to trusted internet connections and TIC 3.0. You know, managed security services are currently part of EIS, as is MTIPS, or Managed Trusted Internet Protocol Solution Services, you know, and these are being updated and expanded for TIC 3.0. You know, solutions for mobility and wireless are also part of our portfolio. Now, the big new technology in this area is, of course, fifth generation wireless, or 5G. So a lot of activity, a lot of change, and I'm particularly going to be on today's panel to share some of our insights. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, Brian. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Brian Conrad. I'm the Cybersecurity Program Manager at the Federal Risk and Authorization Management Program inside the PMO. And I work with cloud service providers who are uh, wanting to get FedRAMP authorizations in order to work with the government. Um, we have uh, extensive outreach to our cloud service providers, our partners who, who want to you know, work with us to protect federal information, who, who provide those uh, very critical commercial cloud services. And um, I've been doing this for almost two years. And um, I also work across the PMO in, in uh, writing and working with the Joint Authorization Board, the CIOs of DHS, GSA, and DOD in formulating policy uh, across the program. And I'm glad to be, be here with you uh, to, to share insights uh, with regard to that. Oh, Brian, we're going to have quite a few questions about federal cloud and FedRAMP for you, so don't worry about that. Great. <laughs> I look least. forward to it. <laughs> Last but not least, um, Sean uh, from CISA. Yeah, thank you, Victoria. And thank you, uh, Laura, Larry, and the GSA team for the opportunity to discuss some of CISA's efforts to support agencies' modernization efforts. But as has been discussed, the TIC initiative is the federal government's architectural strategy on how to protect data and IT resources. For the last 10 years or so, the TIC initiative the strategy was focused on protecting the agency's 
on-premise users and assets. As the users or assets need to leave their agency's traditional IT perimeter and connect to services outside the agency's control. Out of the IT modernization report to the president in 2017, OMB, GSA, and CISA were tasked to update the tech policy and sort of guidance and acquisition vehicles to support agency modernization efforts, including the shift to the cloud, mobile, remote user architectures. In 2019, OMB released Memo 1926, Update to the Tech Initiative. Fast forward to July of this year, in our office at CISA, in heavy coordination with OMB, GSA, and other stakeholders around the uh, federal government, including agency and vendor community, CISA released our updated tech guidance. The new tech guidance sets the framework to support and guide agencies' modernization efforts, including zero trust. And just uh, speaking of zero trust, last month, NIST released their uh, final release of their special pub on zero trust architectures, of which I am one of the four principal authors. Uh, thank you, Victoria. All righty. Well, thank you all so much for those elevator pitches about yourselves and your programs. We are excited to dive right in and share your expertise on these emerging technology areas. All right. Since we now know a little bit more about each of your, your backgrounds and what your programs do, the fun begins now. Let's start very broadly. Kevin, I'd like to start with you. Um, how do you see these emerging technology areas, 5G, AI, IoT, and cloud, impacting federal agencies? How, how does this differ from the ways that maybe private sector is adopting these technologies in terms of the impact and timeline? Well, that, that's a huge question. I'm, I'm going to just focus on, on some areas here. You know, think of the adaptations we've made over the past six or so months. You know, for many jobs, telework and virtual collaboration is now the norm. This all happened almost overnight, and cloud computing was a big enabler. You know, due to technologies like cloud computing, artificial intelligence, 5G, 5G and Internet of Things, you know, the pace of change is, is accelerating. You know, and we're on the cusp of a hyper-connected future. Let's consider the newest of these tech areas, 5G, the fifth generation wireless. Now, 5G offers the potential for lightning speed and massive connectivity. Just like the advent of 3G and 4G revolutionized the way we live and work, I expect similar, if not even greater, changes with 5G. You know, one use case, of course, is smartphones. You know, from a consumer's perspective, that's generally what's associated with 5G. You know, it's mar being marketed quite a bit right now, you know, but it is in the early stages of deployment and performance may not meet, always meet expectations. That will change over time, and government agencies will eventually migrate to faster, more powerful 5G mobile devices. You know, but smartphones are only one use case, and it's actually not the area where 5G is the most differentiated from the you know, predecessor 4G LTE. You know, fixed wireless for network access is another important application. So 5G, with its speeds that can be an order of magnitude faster than 4G, will often be used for last mile access on what's traditionally a wired connection. You know, there's some of this today with 4G, but the performance of 5G will make it much more viable, especially when coupled with software-defined wide area networking, you know, which is designed to use multiple types of connectivity to a location. For example, Ethernet over fiber augmented with a 5G wireless connection. Regarding other use cases, a major difference between 5G and older generations is that commercial enterprises and government agencies are establishing private 5G networks. That's generally not seen for 4G. Now, for example, you know, the U.S. Navy has a pilot project to utilize 5G for smart warehouses. You know, the Air Force is modernizing the infrastructure as bases, and 5G is part of those infrastructure upgrades. You know, I, antici I anticipate this being a common use case for 5G, not just for the Air Force, but government-wide, you know, base and campus area networks relying on 5G. You know, the Army is testing augmented reality virtual reality delivered via 5G for high-fidelity training. So with the proliferation of 5G, AR and VR will increasingly be a part of training, maintenance activities, public safety, you know, and other applications. 
you know, telemedicine or telehealth is another use case with tremendous potential. Earlier this year, the VA announced the world's first 5G-enabled hospital in California. You know, in addition to all the wireless medical devices being, being connected you know, with high bandwidth, 5G can allow you know, high bandwidth and reliably. You know, 5G can allow clinicians and researchers to rapidly access and transport massive amounts of data, you know, such as medical imaging and large data tables. You know, so the ability of 5G to support 100 you know, or more devices than 4G, 100 times more devices than 4G, you know, can greatly expand the use of wearables and portable monitoring. You know, so with 5G, I would anticipate connected devices to become even more pervasive, transmitting a wide variety of critical information to care providers. You know, 5G will enable new communications and data sharing opportunities for emergency services, law enforcement, first responders, you know, including high definition, real time video, data from multiple sensors. You know, and since we're also talking about artificial intelligence, we, this means intelligent video. You know, several agencies are studying the use of 5G with drones. You know, and the list of 5G use cases goes on. You know, so something else to note about 5G is its impact on other technologies. You know, artificial intelligence is one of our topics today. So 5G will spur more AI, more data, and telemetry. You know, it'll provide a huge boost to the Internet of Things. With 5G, we won't just be talking about cloud computing, but we'll be talking much more about edge computing and low latency applications that are enabled by 5G. You know, so that's all the potential, you know, and some of those being rolled out today and more on the horizon. You know, so, so how does federal G, how does federal government adoption of 5G different from the private sector? Well, of course, as is the topic of this conference, security is a forefront concern. You know, I mentioned some healthcare use cases. So privacy is also a major concern. You know, these may or may not be concerns for companies in the private sector, more so for some than others. You know, related to security, there's supply chain, you know, and supply chain risk management. You know, there are laws prohibiting some equipment, you know, in particular some Chinese telecom equipment suppliers, which are, which are big in the 5G space. You know, in, overall, you know, there are a number of federal policies, laws, and acquisition regulations to follow. You know, and, and I particularly mention acquisition because although the pace of change for technology is accelerating, all too often, the acquisition processes impede timely adoption. You know, but fortunately, agencies aren't in this alone. There are communities of practice. You know, with GSA, we aim to be a catalyst for 5G adoption and the role it will play in IT modernization. You know, it's a high priority for us to facilitate the adoption of, of the technology for government agencies. We co-chair the Federal Mobility Group. And in the Federal Mobility Group, 5G cybersecurity and acquisition are all focus areas. You know, regarding acquisition, several of our contracts offer wireless services to make it easier for other agencies to get these services. You know, in particular, the uh, schedules program multiple uh, mobility special item number and enterprise infrastructure solutions. You know, we're planning to update services on these contracts to specifically include 5G. But even before these updates, agencies can get 5G service via these contracts today. You know, so yes, agencies have additional regulations they need to navigate, you know, but they can still be early adopters. So that kind of scratched the surface there on, the, <laughs> on, on that question. Back. That was a very robust response to a very complicated question. <laughs> um, since you dived into the 5G realm, can you talk a little bit more about some of these common threats that 5G networks face? What makes them particularly vulnerable now? Uh, sure, sure. F 5G protocol itself is actually more secure than, uh, than 4G, and certainly more so than 3G. You know, for example, there are no vulnerabilities in the SS7 infrastructure that, that's used for 3G call signaling. You know, 5G presumes an open network. Um, that is, it is not assumed cybersecurity provided by overlaid products. You know, so in 5G, there's, there's more cybersecurity capabilities built in. You know, inter- and intranetwork traffic is encrypted. Signaling traffic is encrypted. There are features to improve privacy. You know, a user's identity and location are, are encrypted. Um, however, at least in the near future, most of the 5G deployments will operate in what's called a non-standalone mode or NSA mode, you know, where it also relies upon the 4G network. 
So many of these operators may not enable all these new features. So, that, so they're in the 5G um, standards there, but, but at least the initial implementation may not always have those enabled. You know, and 5G introduces a, a variety of additional vulnerabilities. You know, historically, oper operator networks have mainly used proprietary protocols for the network management. Now with 5G, it moves to an IP-based protocol stack. This allows interoperability you know, with a wider number of services and technologies. So really in, in, improves the, uh, the capabilities of 5G. But this also means an expanded ecosystem. There's new vendors here. So the supply chain becomes increasingly more complex. You know, the 5G networks will be largely based on software. So that opens the possibility, of course, software you know, development leading to major security flaws. Uh, 5G will entail more virtualization. You know, including of the network centralized control. You know, so this can introduce you know, cloud computing and associated vulnerabilities. Um, one of the capabilities being provided by 5G, the new capability called network slicing. You know, network slices are logical private end-to-end -end networks that can be tailored to meet specific businesses and security requirements. You know, so this can be used to improve overall security and resilience, you know, but at the same time, since the slices are virtually isolated from one another, there's a risk of data leakages between the slices or attacks from one slice to another. And perhaps the greatest concern isn't with 5G itself, but with the impact 5G will have on IoT. You know, so 5G is going to, to help lead to a hyper-connected future. There will be an exponential increase in the number of sites and devices, you know, corresponding increase in attack vectors. You know, so IoT security is a big topic unto itself. You know, this is an area where programs like CDM and concepts like zero trust can be particularly uh, particularly valuable. You need to be able to find, manage, secure, and monitor the devices. Uh, operations and maintenance becomes more complex as the number of devices significantly increases. You know, also, with more endpoints and more traffic, there will be significantly more telemetry and network traffic monitoring. So this can certainly provide security benefits, but it also increases the potential for the exploitation of the network traffic data. You know, and, and yet another consideration is that network operators, which may be telcos or may be agencies for private 5G networks, need to be able to operationalize it. That is, they need to have the skills and procedures to deploy, secure, and maintain it. And particularly since 5G is a new technology, this could be a challenge. You know, so, so a number of security considerations here. You know, in hearing about all these, you know, maybe we may want to think, I don't want to have anything to do with 5G or it's still too early. You know, but conversely, 5G offers so much potential. Agencies need to be planning for it now, understanding where it can apply to their mission and selectively piloting and adopting it. You know, just doing so smartly and securely, gaining the experience to deploy, secure, and maintain it. You know, a lot of good work is, is being done, and there's, there's a strong community of practice within government. So back to you, Victoria. How about one, oh, thank you, Kevin. How about one more question on 5G, and then we'll shift to the next uh, emerging technology area. So as you were wrapping up your, your discussion about vulnerabilities, you mentioned kind of agencies beginning to implement 5G. So how will plan, the plan development of 5G laws, policies, and guidelines affect the procurement timelines for 5G solutions? Okay, well, 5G, I mean, it's, it's leading to this hyper-connected future. I've talked about that, mentioned a couple times. And this, this is a great possibility, but of course, Security is critical. Privacy are critical. And this isn't just for government, but this is really for, uh, for, 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 so for society. I mean, there's, there's safety concerns here, you know, with, with 5G as it, uh, as it uh, one of the use cases here for 5G is with uh, automated vehicles um, there. So, you know, many, many concerns. So security really is critical. And there's certainly no shortage of laws, policies, and guidelines impacting federal agency procurement of uh, 5G. I mean, there are, you know, speaking of guidelines, there's many NIST publications related to cyber security that are relevant to 5G. They may not be 5G specific, but there's, there's all of it, you know, like guidelines related to Internet of Things, um, just, you know, the, the special pubs talking about protecting controlled, unclassified Internet information in non-federal systems and organizations. 
you know, that relates to some of the service providers who are going to be providing five, you know, service over 5G networks to, uh, to federal agencies. Um, there is also, though, the supply chain specific uh, regulations. Um, executive order for securing the information and communications technology and services supply chains. You know, there's the National Defense Authorization Act of 2019 and the Section 889. I think that will probably be a topic of the, the next panel here, talking about supply chain risk and uh, about there being prohibited uh, suppliers. And, of course, there's the uh, Trade Agreements uh, Act also, and which federal government needs to consider all of these. So there's many, uh, many of these that need to be navigated. Um, but, you know, so that at times will slow some of the, uh, the adoption, but, uh, you know, some of these policies and guidelines, you know, such as the NIST publications, can actually make it easier to acquire reliable and secure 5G services and solutions. Remember, the goal isn't just fielding a solution. We want to be able to field a secure solution, and this includes the supply chain. You know, agencies rightfully prioritize reliability and security, you know, and it's, it's different than the, than the consumer marketplace here, and it's different than how some commercial enterprises are, are approaching the, the technology. So, again, there, there are these guidelines there, but there's community practices to help agencies navigate these, and, and they can actually make it easier to acquire reliable and secure 5G services and solutions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kevin. All right, guys, let's shift gears to IoT. Kevin already teed this topic up briefly in his explanation of 5G. Um, think, you know, we're all sitting in our home offices, right? Just think, how many IoT devices are currently in your home office? How many are you wearing at this moment? I'll, I'll start this, uh, I'll open this question to all the panelists first. How does, this age, how does your agency or you personally define and scope IoT? I think it's, it's such a common buzzword, but I think we all might have a slightly different interpretation of it. So how, to, how would you scope that? Uh, any takers? I would suggest, uh, it's Adam, thank you. Um, I would suggest that we fall on to NIST approach to this. I think the NIST guidelines for IoT implementation uh, specifically don't rely on the term IoT, they refer to it generally as, in, as for context, but they fall back on the term connected device. And those guidelines, specifically the security guidelines, tend to work around any device that is connected to the network, which means from this perspective, a printer that has its own network socket and a smart speaker or any other IoT device are all the same, and they manage the same, and they present the same amount of risk. I think the reasoning that Nis mentioned for that, and please, I might be wrong on this quote, but I think it's in 8.228, was that the level of risk of any device that is connected to your network is identical because all of them are capable of performing above their prescribed capabilities. Um, so by definition, if it's plugged into the wall and beeps, it's IoT and needs to be treated from a risk perspective as any other IoT device. That's a wonderful uh, description of, of IoT or connected devices. And I, I promise to all the, the participants, I did not tell Kevin or Adam to cite NIST publication. <laughs> um, any other panelists uh, have their, their thoughts on how they're scoping IoT? Hey, this is Sean Conley. Yeah, I'd like to just position from the tech program office side. So uh, I, I think you're spot on in terms of capturing the domain of Internet things and how we're starting to look at it. And from our program office and through OMB and uh, our team at GSA, including Kevin, we've heard, okay, what does Internet of Things mean in the, the framework of tech? And so uh, I think we'll talk about use cases a little later on, and use cases are these different architectures to support these modernization efforts. Um, but Internet of Things is also one of those. And so um, we have these different use cases coming out. There's the ones that are captured in the OMB memo I mentioned earlier. Then there's the others use cases, uh, which we have that we expect that agencies will want us to focus on. And Internet of Things is one of those use cases we look at uh, addressing uh, once we get the first, what we call the first round of uh, uh, use cases out. 
So when you talk to some of the agencies in terms of they have maybe physical Internet thing sensors, whether it could be tsunami warning sensors or forest fire sensors or uh, uh, farm sensors that uh, recognize crop yields, or maybe more on the law enforcement side that may monitor some of the criminal activities or financial side that monitors the financial networks. These are all different sensors and Internet of things, if you will, that the agencies use. And it's, they're, they're outside, some of them are outside what the agencies consider their traditional boundary. And so I think this is a great question. I don't want to be uh, pre-selective on what we'll look at, but I think this is something that we definitely want to look at from the um, TIC program office. Excellent. Well, so Adam, you had mentioned kind of smart devices when you were scoping out and giving some examples of your IoT or connected devices. Um, are there federal policies to ensure that approved manufacturers of these smart devices proactively release patches to, to mitigate uh, any discovered vulnerabilities. Um, you know, these devices are kind of released into our systems and networks with varying lifespans, right? So we need to understand what those risks are and how to manage them according to their life cycle. Uh, somebody muted me. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so I am going to go back to uh, quoting NIST again, uh, since they're probably the best source of policies for emerging technologies. Um, I, the two publications that I've been working with is, are 8228 and 8259. Um, 8228 is essentially an informative guideline as to what are connected devices, what are smart devices, what are the risk implications of them. If you were a CISO of an agency or CIO of an agency and you wanted to start looking into building your own IoT management and IoT security policies, 8228 is where you'd want to go. It's a fantastic foundation to start working off of. Um, the second one, 8259, is actually a guideline for IoT developers on how to develop and maintain the security of connected devices. Um, and that goes down into a lot of details, asking or providing recommendations to developers um, how to identify customers and define expected use cases, research customer cybersecurity goals so that you can determine how to address them, how to identify your devices, how to configure devices, how do you protect the data that exists inside the devices, how to create customer support, how to provide um, both upgrades for firmware and software, and how to communicate, how the devices itself can communicate their current security status. From a federal acquisition perspective, what this does is it gives us a fantastic roadmap for developing our requirements when we go out into the market and start acquiring IoT devices. Um, we can define the set, these recommendations as a base set of requirements that we only bring IoT devices with appropriate level of um, inherent pre-planning for security issues into our acquisition process so that by the time that we actually award a contract, we are only dealing with products that can plug in directly into those compliance programs that we set up in the original discussion about 8228. Um, from the perspective of um, building your internal, uh, sorry, the internal policies that as you're expanding your existing security uh, perspective to look into uh, monitoring IoT devices, monitoring firmware expiration dates. There are a couple of federal uh, frameworks that are in place, like the DOD Continuous Diagnostic Mitigation Framework, the CDM, or again, I'm quoting this the entire time, I apologize, the NIST Framework for Improving Official Infrastructure Cybersecurity. Both of these have released new IoT guidelines in the last year, year and a half, and they follow very similar approaches to any other historical connected device, but they 
add several other checkpoints that are fairly easy for an organization to implement and will provide a decent enough work before you actually go out and hire dedicated expertise to pull into your CISO shop. Um, one of the things that we do as the COE, we get to work with organizations as they adopt these new technologies. Um, less on the IoT side, now we're touching more on the AI and RPA sides. Um, as we introduce these new risks, we get to sit with the CISO shops and help them develop their internal controls for anything from cloud over to actual IoT and RPA technologies. All of these require a set of expertise that I would suggest you bring in if you don't already have them in your shop to set up. But once they're in place, they are part of the standard approach of uh, device control that already exists in the federal government. So they're not that far out of the standard area of comfort. I apologize Excellent. again Thank for you. so much nice quoting. It's all right, Adam. I, I like when, uh, you know, people are quoting NIST and using our guidance. Well, it seems that NIST has, you know, put out quite a variety of frameworks and resources that can be used in, broadly in IoT and other emerging, um, uh, emerging technology areas. Um, and I think it's a real, you really brought up a great point that it, there's a big security challenge with these connected devices. They're ubiqui ubiquitous, they're distributed, they're connected with a range of security and privacy risks. Um, let, let's look at CISA. I know that TIC has um, also developed some guidance. Do you have any guidance that agencies can refer to a system um, in addressing some of these risks uh, from IoT, such as remote patch management? Sean? Yep, hi, sorry. Um, so remote patch management, that's a great question. And when we released our guidance over the summer, um, some agencies were coming back to CISA and asking about remote patch management. And so what happened, and this, this I thought was pretty fascinating, was inside CISA, a, different part of our organization was hearing from the agencies about they were struggling, how do we apply the TIC guidance for remote patch management and vulnerability uh, management? Uh, so that office uh, created this new guidance and then uh, worked it through our office, the TIC office, and then in August, uh, CISA released this guidance to the agencies. And the guidance was built out uh, to share recommendations for patching remote devices uh, roaming outside agencies' traditional network during these, this time of expanded telework. It was in response to the reported VPN bandwidth constraints that are impacting the timely patching of roaming devices and degrading or interrupting other vital services being uh, accessed remotely. So uh, I mentioned how this telework, or I'm sorry, this remote patch guidance, it leveraged the interim telework guidance that we released in April. So all this is different ways that CISA is coming together to support and offer guidance, architectural guidance to the agencies on how to support these modernization efforts. The uh, remote patch management guides I'm talking about, uh, it's been released a couple different ways. Uh, people can find it on the CISA's webpage. Uh, I know one site where it is located is under the CISA uh, Trusted Internet Connections webpage. If you go to most search engines and type in CISA uh, and space tick. The, our website will be one of the first ones to come up. On our website, we have the uh, interim guidance uh, section, and that's one of the guidance uh, that's available for everyone to download. So it's a pretty simple document, only a few pages long, but again, it's just addresses this very tactical question, how do we support uh, re remote patch management in, in these new environments? Excellent. It seems that multiple agencies have a plethora of resources to assist both agencies and um, manufacturers and the end consumer ultimately on understanding, securing uh, their IoT or connected devices. So that's excellent to hear. All right, let's go back and talk a little bit of, about 
the cloud. I think that's something that's fundamental across all of these emerging technologies and why probably one of the more mature emerging technologies. It's the most emerged. <laughs> um, so, uh, Brian, you mentioned you're from FedRAMP. Um, with the reach that FedRAMP has across so many agencies and providers, uh, what are some of the lessons, uh, can you provide a, an example or some examples of how cloud computing is really making a difference now? Um, and in your experience at FedRAMP, what are some of these lessons learned surrounding cloud that might help both our government and industry colleagues in this discussion? Sure. So cloud technology has been a huge enabler. Um, it, it's been mentioned previously that, you know, with all these different types of emerging technologies coming along, uh, the data needs to go somewhere. And so um, agencies need places to store the data. They're not going to build data centers. And fortunately, we have commercial cloud providers um, that, that are willing and able to do that. And through FedRAMP, um, we, we provide a host of, of authorized, you know, secure cloud, commercial cloud solutions to enable agencies to do that. Um, and, you know, one can go on the marketplace. Uh, the FedRAMP marketplace is searchable. It's sortable. Um, you can find the, the uh, service model that you like uh, or that you need and, uh, and go from there. And, you know, having that FedRAMP authorization is a, is a, uh, is a point of relief or a, a, a point of confidence for the agency that that cloud service provider has been vetted either by the Joint Authorization Board or uh, by another agency, and it meets the rigorous FedRAMP standards, uh, which are built on NIST uh, controls. I wanted to throw that in for you too, Vic, uh, Vicki. Um, so it, it, it's our, it's our mission, the FedRAMP mission is also taking on a greater urgency, um, and, and we're in a unique position. We see agencies wanting to modernize, and it, it, the cool thing is we, FedRAMP kind of sits at the nexus between our commercial providers and the agencies because we see the agencies wanting to uh, push the envelope, um, you know, in, embrace emerging technology. And we see the, the really cool things on the other hand that the commercial cloud service providers are doing. And, you know, through working with the cloud service providers and addressing their challenges and, and to ensure that, you know, these eight, the federal agencies have a secure place to put all that data. Um, you know, supporting the ability to work remotely um, the use of cloud has, has helped the government become uh, more resilient. Um, and, you know, it, as mentioned before, the sudden growth in virtual work has, has been supported by that. Um, we're, we offer also um, a way to help agencies through our, our newly minted agency liaison program. So with an, a greater demand for secure cloud, uh, you know, there's more agency involvement. And this year we launched an agency liaison program, which is essentially designed to transform the way FedRAMP informs and collaborates with federal agencies. So um, it's a voluntary program, and agencies can, can nominate a, a, a person to be sort of their touch point back to the FedRAMP PMO for that particular agency. And, and so far, we found it very successful. Uh, even very early on in the program when we were sharing information about emergency directives and binding operational directives, having that list of folks uh, in, in their respective agencies really helped the communication uh, chain in, in getting that information out. Excellent. That's, uh, I mean, FedRAMP has been doing a lot, and I do always appreciate a NIST shout-out as well. <laughs> um, so let's, let's look at cloud from the CISA perspective. Um, Sean, how does some of the updated TIC guidance help agencies move to the cloud? Um, how, how will the TIC program be, uh, will the TIC program be releasing additional guidance to support agencies as they transition to cloud-based services? Sure, so the TIC offices efforts to support cloud have been going on for well over five years. You know, Brian from the FedRAMP team and hearing Maria wrote before, uh, uh, some of the early activities toward uh, TIC and FedRAMP go back to when Maria led the FedRAMP office and at Goodrich when he led the uh, FedRAMP office and again now through Ashley's team. Um, there's, there's a number of ways we're supporting the, the agency's migration to cloud because we're hearing this more and more obviously. Just we need we need more guidance. We need more examples of 
how the agencies can uh, transition to the cloud, how the agencies can connect to the cloud, what type of telemetry or visibility should the agencies have from a security perspective, uh, perspective toward, toward those cloud environments. So in what we developed so far allows uh, agencies a broader interpretation authorities to be assumed by the agencies uh, due to the wide variety of modern IT environments and requirements based on the agency's missions, their needs, and the resources across uh, the, all the agencies. The TIC3 supports direct connections to cloud-based services, does not require agencies to backhaul their connections through the traditional TIC access points as there was in TIC2 architectures. Meaning so now where agencies can more directly uh, have their users and resources access those cloud environments in ways that uh, maybe wouldn't have been available or uh, possible through the old uh, on-premise castle mode solutions. The updated guidance introduces new concepts like trust zones and policy enforcement points and that can assist agencies as they move the cloud. The agencies can use those trust zones to implement security controls at this new perimeter uh, across uh, the agency's different uh, architectures. Ideally, what we're trying to do with these trust zones is uh, give agencies flexibility to move the security controls closer to the data but one of the uh, um, caveats for TIC in general is that some agencies still support traditional macro segmentation or uh, um, internal network boundary and then everything channels through the agency's uh, TIC access points. Well, some agencies are starting to shift toward micro segmentation or zero trust. So the TIC initiative itself has to have the framework to support both those type of architectures in place. So some agencies very much all in, if you will, toward the cloud and supporting cloud environments. Other agencies are much more tactical in how they want to support cloud environments and how those resources in the cloud can be uh, accessed both from their uh, traditional users and possibly from the public also. So we're, we're building this guidance out. It's uh, starting to be released. I mentioned we released the core documents uh, this summer and then we're going to start releasing these use cases. And so ideally what we want TIC to do is to be able to support zero trust architectures, uh, uh, SD-WAN, secure access service edge type of architectures. These new concepts are becoming more popular as the cloud adoption increases and that traditional security perimeter dissolves. So we work with Kevin's team uh, quite closely in GSA and uh, the FedRAM team also. Just make sure that the guidance that's coming out collectively to support the agency is, uh, uh, supports each other's programs and missions. I think cloud is an excellent example of how the, the federal agencies have come together to, to support other agencies and the, the manufacturers and private sector that, that offers these services and solutions. So thank you to all of you for that. Um, so there's, you know, cloud has been a great success story and there's some great lessons learned as well. Um, it seems like some of these lessons learned from cloud, both on the security perspective and the acquisition perspective, can be applied to these new emerging technology areas. So I'll open this question up to all of our panelists. And while I, you can't see me, I'm definitely looking at you, Brian, first. <laughs> <laughs> what are the lessons learned? What are some lessons learned from cloud security and acquisitions that could be applied to 5G, IoT, and AI as well, and, and potentially other emerging technologies as they come along? Absolutely. So, you know, start with security up front, especially when considering new technologies. Um, you know, ensuring that the products are built with security is a forethought, avoids the problem of retrofitting of security, uh, you know, on the back end, baking it on, baking it in and uh, vice bolting it on uh, kind of concept. Um, agencies should clearly detail requirements, um, at least from our perspective, for the cloud service providers to maintain. Um, we also, through FedRAMP, have continuous monitoring requirements. So we're looking and actively maintaining or, or looking to ensure that the cloud service providers actively maintain their cybersecurity posture. Um, when it comes to uh, security, uh, clearly defined roles and responsibilities. With the cloud, we have a shared security model. There are certain things that the cloud provider will do, uh, and there are certain things that the customer or the agency, the using agency, has to do. So an understanding of that 
uh, delineation of, of that shared responsibility model also really important. And, you know, also including security authorization requirements, performance criteria, deliverables, and other, other stuff like that, other things like that, um, you know, in, in performance outcomes, um, there, are some, there are some things that can be done, you know, via contracting as well. And like, you know, additional security requirements, deliverables, uh, performance objectives, uh, or criteria, and stuff like that. Excellent. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, other panelists? Yeah, so, well, so this Brian is Sean. So, covered some. Go ahead, Sean. <laughs> no, I was just I was just going to talk about uh, reiterate some of what we discussed before, but give a little different context. So, uh, through CISA, heavy coordination with OMB and the federal CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer Council, um, we are beginning to solicit and monitor tick pilot that's going to be used uh, to create new use cases. So the, the security aspects we're looking to address for uh, different agencies toward these use cases. In the OMI memo, there's a remote user use case, infrastructure is a service use case, uh, SAS use case, email is a service, and uh, uh, PaaS, platform as a service. These are our use cases that uh, we sit are on the hook to produce and the Federal Assistive Council will adopt and promote uh, across .gov. And so, uh, we, we talked about these pilots in terms of how agencies are adopting and modernizing their environments. At the same time, we distilled some of the lessons learned about what the agencies are doing in terms of security. How is the agency gaining visibility into these environments? And it's also a pilot process uh, for CISA internally, if you will. CISA has that mission to have that panoramic view across the federal civilian.gov horizon. So when CISA supports these agency pilots, it's for us to learn new types of telemetry, new types of visibility into these environments and understand the, uh, the attributes and information that can come back to CISA, understand how agencies are accessing these networks. All right. What, what I was that visibility also add is really important. Yeah. Brian and Sean covered a, a, a lot, and I think what I'm going to say is a little bit of a piggyback almost on what, what Sean's saying here is, is when agencies are looking at security for these technologies, you know, they, they're not, agencies don't have to do it themselves. Um, there's a lot of information out there, communities of practice in, in government there, you know, so for, for cloud computing, of course, FedRAMP and their website and all their resources associated with that. There's the uh, Cloud Information Center. Obviously, all the NIST documents um, that are, are out there, and there's the security uh, security guidelines. Um, if you're talking about 5G and mobility-related security, there's the uh, Federal Mobility Group on the Acquisition Gateway. Or you can also join the Federal Mobility Group with the page there on, uh, on OMB Maps. Um, with uh, with information related to that, some of the things I was talking about earlier regarding 5G security and just mobility and 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 some Internet of Things security too, because that Federal Mobility Group is that's another focus area of theirs is uh, is Internet of Things. Uh, regarding trusted Internet connections, I mean the information you know Sean just mentioned it briefly, but there really is some, some key information that's been put out there um, by CESA, because what you know we're seeing here on changes to agencies' enterprise networks. Cloud computing is really driving a lot of that change. So it's changing the architecture of the networks. It's changing the cybersecurity requirements for those, uh, for those networks. And, you know, TIC 3.0 is, is, is just a major enabler for, for agencies for that. You know, the flexibility is there and a lot of the guidance that's already been updated and available. For, uh, for agencies, and, uh, and, uh, and more, more is on the way, too. So agencies, it's, there are these communities of practice, and to, it's, it's for people who are designing cybersecurity within an agency. It's not there. It's to learn from, the, uh, from what others are doing in best practices. Excellent. Any other panelists want to weigh in on this? Just real quick from the... Unlike everybody else on this panel, I actually sit on the consumer side of the services that are provided by these groups. Specifically, Brian and Sean, I consume your resources on a daily basis. 
Um, the guidance that FedRAMP offers has been a phenomenal tool to focus both CSAW's and program office approach to acquiring and establishing standards for emerging technology. We've been able to take product that would have taken me months to get through, years to get through security compliance internally in an agency and shorten that to two or three months. This is an agency that have never even implemented cloud or even SaaS solutions before. Um, so just a shout out moment of thank all three of you for the services that you offer. They've made our work on the ground so much easier. That's excellent. It's it's wonderful to see that, you know, the different parts of government working together so well and leveraging the, the good work done by, within the missions of, of other agencies. We're going to take a quick pause and shift to any audience questions. So to my panelists, can I direct your attention to the Q&A pod or the chat pod that's only visible to you? And as questions begin to roll in, I, I encourage you to um, you know, to uh, respond. Uh, the first one, um, since we have a question in the queue already, is a request for Sean. Can you please talk a little bit more about how CISA, the CIO Council, OMB, et cetera, is solicit soliciting use cases from agencies? Uh, what's the process, the RFI? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And we're hearing that, and this is one of the, the, the big differences, if you will, from TIC2 to TIC3, this flexibility that you hear about uh, from OMB, the flexibility in different architectures. So the use cases themselves and the pilots. I mentioned the architectures that'll be these alternative uh, use cases. And we build those use cases off of agency pilots. And so instead of the agency pilots uh, uh, being supported, if you will, just from CISA or from OMB, the Federal CISO Council We'll do this data call to agencies, asking agencies to submit their proposals for a possible pilot. So I'll just use Zero Trust. The Federal CISO Council will uh, do a data call to agencies saying we are looking for a Zero Trust, uh, Zero Trust pilots. And they'll, you know, we'll, we'll just say 30 days for the agency to respond. Agencies can work with different vendors and different stakeholders to build out these proposals. The agencies will submit those proposals back to the Federal CISO Council. The CISO Council, in coordination with uh, CISA, GSA, other stakeholders, will look through all these uh, uh, proposals, and the CISO Council will decide which proposals best meet the intent of that zero trust uh, use case that we want to build out. Then those agencies, uh, they are selected. They'll move forward with their pilots uh, in the background. CISA and GSA will be monitoring the pilots. And then after a certain amount of time, uh, CISA will distill those lessons learned into uh, a draft use case. That draft use case will then be uh, forwarded to the uh, Federal CISO Council. The CISO Council will uh, review and maybe you know, change or orientate something differently. But the idea is uh, those use cases will then be promoted and adopted across .gov. So, Ideally, what's going to happen is you'll have a number of pilots that will support these use cases coming out. Excellent. Thank you. All righty. So we have a, another audience question on 5G, but we do, I would like to encourage audience members to submit your questions in the Q&A chat pod. We want to make sure that we get the opportunity to grill, I mean, ask the subject matter experts here on this panel all of your burning questions about all these emerging technology areas. Um, so the question, is, the one question we have in the queue is incredibly technical. So uh, if I don't mind uh, asking that perhaps you follow up in an email because this might be a longer conversation than the, the five minutes uh, we have left on our panel and Larry gives us the hook. <laughs> Um, so let's close out our, our question uh, question session with a oh, wait, a few more questions are coming in. Um, let's see. 
Uh, so this this person is this question from the audience is I'm a newly registered federal contractor company. My company is using some of these emerging technologies. Um, is there any protocol with any of your offices for vetting the security of their solutions? Thank you. Any as, mentioned, as I mentioned before, that's exactly what uh, needs, uh, sorry, numbers uh, 82590 is for, specifically for IoT devices. Uh, there is not exactly a NIS 82590 compliance, but the review of 82590 and their um, suggested features is about as, as specific as the federal government gets right now. Thank you so much for yet another shout out to this, Adam. <laughs> All right, guys, we have four minutes left on this panel. So we're going to close out with a lightning round question uh, that I'm going to pose to all of our panelists. Um, so I'd like, as, as our closing thoughts and the final question, what is the biggest challenge and opportunity for either federal agencies or um, you know, uh, private sector companies for acquiring these emerging technologies and in securely integrating them into their systems and services. You guys have a minute each. I'll go first. Don't reinvent the wheel. A reoccurring problem in the federal government is that they keep trying to create their own acquisition vehicles, their own standards. As soon as we can get an agency to focus on the existing standards, most of which are offered by Brian and Sean's groups, we can actually get things done much faster. Um, learn, utilize existing resources. Excellent stage advice, Adam. Appreciate that. Yeah, this is Brian. I, I would have to echo that. Um, you know, we just hit, in FedRAMP, we just hit the 200 authorization mark. So there are 200 different cloud services authorized uh, that have FedRAMP authorizations on our marketplace, okay? Um, that, that number has gone, had doubled uh, in the last two years. So it took six years to get 100. It, went, it took only two years to add another 100 to that. So there, you know, there are plenty of, of cloud solutions of different size, you know, different size business, different service model that all have FedRAMP authorizations in good standing. So um, there, there's a lot of a lot of choice out there for agencies to use um, to see what fits their needs. Excellent. Yes, let's use the great resources that we've put put together. So this is Sean. Uh, I'll add oh, here. Go, go ahead, Gabby. Uh, I'll add here is uh, mission first. So don't adopt these emerging technologies just because you're hearing these are great new emerging technologies. You know, you, you do it because it's going to enhance your mission. I mean, cloud computing, you know, cloud computing there, it, it adds agility, scalability, and, 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 and efficiencies. You know, for 5G, I mentioned a number of uh, use cases related to 5G and IoT that agencies are piloting. They're not doing that just because it's 5G, it's because it's actually enhancing emission needs, like smart warehouses there for, uh, for the Navy. So that's the thing. Think for first, first mission and then, and then technology later. So this is Sean. So Thank I'll you so much. A oh, little bit. Sean, go ahead. Sorry, take us home. <laughs> sure. No, no, I'll pivot a little bit and uh, give an example of how CISA is starting to adopt these um, modern technologies. And the way I'll pivot is I'll pivot towards one of the um, initial uh, requirements or uh, missions for CISA was gain of visibility that I mentioned before of the agency's networks. So one of the ways that CISA is moving forward is uh, we have a, a new service. It's under the National Cybersecurity Protection System, NCPS. It's called CLAW, the Cloud Log Aggregation Warehouse Pilot. And CLAW focuses on ingesting those na cloud native uh, security uh, information types from cloud vendors, not only to create network based sensor, net I'm sorry, network sensor based equivalency, which we did with our old uh, solution, still in place at the traditional ticks, but also what we're looking to do is what additional information of these environments is analytically relevant to accomplish this mission to protect federal uh, civilian uh, uh, agencies. So as agencies leverage 
third party security services to monitor the network traffic to and from the internet and from their uh, different environments. The system's claw also allows for the ingestion of the, the log data from these commercial vendors. And that whole workflow is built upon collabor collaboration with cloud vendors and agencies and utilizes native cloud services to the extent possible. And, you get, and this is all available, if you, again, I mentioned the CISA's TIG website. If the, uh, people go to the, our website, there is a section under it called TIC and National Cybersecurity Protection System. And to click on that, uh, there's a document available called the Cloud Interface Reference Architecture. And this starts down CISA, down this path of new types of telemetry and new opportunities uh, to gain awareness. Excellent. So in short, let's, let's not reinvent the wheel on these emerging technologies. There are, there are good resources and practices available from many federal agencies that can be leveraged regardless of who you are, what your organization does. Focus on your mission. Just because it's a buzzword and everyone is using it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be implementing these technologies. And, and look to our panelists if you have any follow-up questions on, on any of their portfolio areas. Um, with that, we are one minute over, and Larry is going to kick us off this stage. So thank you so much to our wonderful panelists, Brian, Sean, Kevin, and Adam, for sharing their expertise with us today. If you've asked us a question that did not get answered or think of follow-up questions after this panel, please be sure to take down the panelists' emails and follow up. So once again, thank you to our experts, and I'm going to turn this back over to Larry. Vicki, thank you so much. Thank you, Sean, Kevin, Adam, and Brian, for a highly informative panel that um, really underscores and highlights the importance of the partnership uh, between the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, NIST, um, GSA, and uh, OMB. And, um, and, and how among those agencies and among the, uh, the leadership from uh, those entities, the importance of partnering and, and in um, cybersecurity for the United States government and then collaborating with industry to deliver those solutions and partner uh, to provide the, the solutions to uh, government agencies uh, to accomplish their missions with security. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for waiting patiently with us. Um, it's now my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce the next panel. Um, I will introduce the moderator, Sean Leblanovitz, and Sean will introduce the panelists. Sean Leblanovitz is the Senior Advisor for Cybersecurity in GSA's Office of IT Category. Sean has been with GSA for more than 10 years now, and in fact, Sean established the IT Security Division in GSA's Office of IT. Back then, it was Integrated Technology Solutions, but that's the forerunner to the Office of IT category. And in standing up that office, Sean created a team of cybersecurity experts to address the cybersecurity needs in uh, GSA's solutions and GSA's entire IT portfolio and established partnerships with uh, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, and the National Institute of Standard Technology, and of course, the Office of Management and Budget. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Sean. Thank you so much, Larry, for that warm introduction. It really is a pleasure this morning to spend a little bit of time talking with some movers and shakers in the supply chain risk management industry that are really focused on helping us across government figure out how to navigate this new and emerging space. As security and technology continues to emerge, we'll find that the supply chain risk management requirements will become sort of an emerging discipline. I am so pleased to have Ms. Lisa Barr, who is the Federal Acquisition Security Council project lead within OMB, Kelly Arts, who is the Supply Chain Risk Management Technical Lead in GSA's FAST Office of Policy and Compliance, and Keith Nakasone, who is the Deputy Assistant Commissioner for Acquisition within GSA's Office of the IT category. 
I want it to allow just a couple of minutes for each of my panelists this morning to tell a little bit about who they are. So if we'll start with Lisa, then we'll go to Kelly and then move to Keith and we'll jump into our conversation this morning. So Lisa, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Sean. And you know, thanks to Kelly and Keith too for, for being for all of us being on this panel. It's uh, I like being with friends and colleagues who I've known now for, for a few years. Uh, so uh, Lisa Barr, I am I am actually uh, with the Department of Homeland Security and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. And I've been with the department for about 11 years. Um, in the past year, uh, I've been detailed to OMB OFCIO with the purpose of being solely focused on running and leading efforts under the Federal Acquisition Security Council. So I have been very much uh, engaged in supply chain efforts over the past year. Uh, and really it's been with such a great group of people from across the interagency. So I'm excited for today's discussion. I'm excited uh, to talk about where the Federal Acquisition Security Council is going. And I'm certainly also very interested and excited about talking about sort of now being able to address supply chain risk holistically across the federal enterprise, which I think is a great place uh, for us to be uh, at this current date and time. So thank you. Hi. Good morning. This is uh, Kelly and Sean. Thanks a lot for um, for having and us here and hosting the panel. It's always a pleasure to to work with. Lisa and Keith, um, we 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 all three. This team of folks chats regularly about emerging supply chain risk issues and the long-term path that we're crafting together to secure the federal enterprise. So I um, cut my teeth at CIA as an analyst uh, for a few years out of college before going to graduate school and getting an MBA. When I returned uh, from the master's program, I worked for over 20 years in um, IT management, uh, supporting the intelligence community as well as DOD. A lot of years at the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, working on hard IT problems um, and managing teams to do that um, as a program manager there, uh, as a contractor. Um, and then I also have certifications from ISACA, and I'm a certified information security manager, as well as certified in the governance of enterprise IT. So with those credentials, I come to GSA. I've been at GSA almost two years, helping to stand up the FAST uh, Supply Chain Risk Management Program, and I'm delighted to work with Lisa um, to support the Federal Acquisition Security Council. And over to you, Keith. Hi, good morning. My name is Keith Nakasene, Deputy Assistant Commissioner for Acquisitions in the IT category. Um, I'm glad to be here today. Uh, spent a, a good amount of time working within the Department of Defense for 20 some years. Um, and then over, uh, spent some time over at the Federal Communications Commission and then here at GSA for the past um, almost five years. And um, with my depth and um, breadth of experience working in the uh, area of telecommunications and IT, um, you know, the most, uh, most concerning thing that we always look at is uh, cybersecurity and supply chain risk management when we look at IT. So I'm glad to be part of the panel and hope to uh, provide some of the insights from an acquisition perspective it, it, on the subject matter. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion with our with my colleagues. Thank you here. so much, Keith, um, Lisa, Kelly. We really do have a breadth of expertise on this panel. And so I'm really excited to just jump into some of the overview of things that we will talk about today with supply chain. Lisa, if I could start out with you and ask what OMB's role is in supply chain risk management. Sure, yeah, that's a, it's a great question and, and, and thanks for this one. Um, so, you know, supply chain risk management is, is not new in the federal government, right? This has been sort of an ongoing conversation, I would say, for the past decade or so. Um, but, and obviously OMB 
as uh, in the executive office of the president and across the federal civilian executive branch has a very strong leadership role, not only in the, in, obviously in the budget formulation and the, and the policy front, uh, but also sort of as, as, a, as the, the leader in sort of the unbiased view that we need to have across the federal enterprise um, to ensure that as we're thinking about supply chain risk, that, that we're thinking about it holistically. So one of the things that I would say is a key role for OMB in supply chain risk management is under the Federal Acquisition Supply Chain Security Act of 2018. OMB was named the chairperson of the Federal Acquisition Security Council itself. And this allows OMB to uh, convene the council, um, establish a governance structure, facilitate the development of recommendations for removal and exclusion orders, ensure priorities under this statute are uh, being met, and ensuring relevant risk information is being shared across the federal enterprise. Uh, so the, the role that OMB has is obviously diverse, uh, but certainly one of the very important functions is this chairing of the Federal Acquisition Security Council, because really the ability to convene agencies uh, across the enterprise to start coalescing and talking about and addressing supply chain risks is a, is a very powerful place for OMB to be sitting. Perfect. I, I appreciate that. And I'm so glad that you brought up the FASC and really allowing agencies to sort of get their feet wet in the understanding of some of the, the goals and, and the tasks that are associated with what you're trying to do in that area. Can you give us a little bit more detail into what the goals and some of the initial deliverables that the FASC is trying to achieve? Sure, yeah, so the council itself has been around since, look, it's actually came out at the end of December. I think the FASC first convened its meeting in March of 2019. So over the past year and a half or so, the FASC had largely been focused on um, establishing itself as a council, creating the charter, ensuring there's a strategic plan in place, um, creating uh, constituent bodies to be able to carry out the functions of the Federal Acquisition Security Council. So there is a working group, there is a task force that's been established, both of which are intended to cover the priorities that are required for the council. And some of those goals are really focused around the, certainly one of the things that I think is probably one of the most important uh, goals or priorities of the FAST is the ability to make recommendations to the Secretary of Homeland Security, the Secretary of Defense, and the Director of National Intelligence to remove covered articles or entities that pose too great a risk to the federal enterprise. Um, to me, that, from a personal standpoint, not necessarily the professional one, that is an area where I really want to see the Federal Acquisition Security Council be able to make some advancements. You know, we know we have, we know we have, uh, you know, we know that there are problems across the federal enterprise. We know that there are risks to our supply chain. We need to have a much stronger approach to how we're going to remove and exclude these entities from getting into our federal enterprise to begin with, whether it's in legacy systems or in emerging technology. So that is one of, certainly one of the largest priorities and focus areas under the Federal Acquisition Security Council. Another area, our goal is to ensure that relevant supply chain risk information is being shared with federal entities to be able to make risk informed decisions. So not just sharing information for the sake of sharing information, but sharing relevant risk information that's going to allow federal departments and agency heads to make their own risk decisions about what they are acquiring. Um, and then lastly, and probably is part of our stretch goal, is the ability to share supply chain risk information more broadly with non-federal entities in a more uh, coordinated fashion. So there is the desire to be able to engage uh, uh, across uh, the community, uh, to be able to share supply chain risk information. But, you know, our initial priority is definitely on the federal side of things. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So a couple of things I took away from that was the awareness. So understanding just sort of what supply chain risk management is and how to tackle that. I heard you speak about executing a plan to move forward, right? So taking the conceptualized thinking of supply chain and really having a way to operationalize that 
across an enterprise and figure out where you need to sort of make insertions. You also talked about information sharing that I think is really important, having the ability to not only collect information, but to share that in your informed decision making going forward. Kelly, if I could ask specifically, because, you know, looking at how an agency can start to think about this and also having that important partnership with OMB looking government wide, can you talk a little bit about how you've been able to support GSA and the FAST to implement some of the things from the, the working group into our organization? Sure, Sean, thanks. So um, as, as many of you may already know, uh, the, the Federal Acquisition Security Council that Lisa um, mentioned is made up of about 11 different federal agencies and Lisa and her boss chair that, that group. Uh, GSA's FAST commissioner, Julie Dunn, is GSA's representative to the FASC, and I am the plus one to support uh, Julie in those, in those meetings and the um, efforts that, that come from those meetings. I also sit on the FASC working group uh, along with Lisa and a representative from OGP, our Office of Government-Wide Policy. So we've supported um, the FAST Working Group and Lisa in developing um, the charter and the strategic plan uh, with the FASC. Um, and those have been delivered to Congress. Lisa and her team and boss have briefed Congress on those, those items. We've also uh, continued, Sean, as, as you know, to uh, make, to create and increase awareness inside FAST, um, and particularly in our Scrum Champions Program. Uh, the elements of the FASC that are underway based on the Secure Technology Act, and now we're in the process of briefing awareness uh, around the FASC IFR. Perfect. Um, you know, I, I've had the pleasure of, of watching you take supply chain risk management um, with varying levels of maturity across the organization and, and really be a foundational leadership um, entity and I, I want to call you as one person an entity because that's what you've done to really create our supply chain risk management program in response to the Secure Technology Act. So one, thank you for your leadership in that space. But two, if you could just talk about, you know, your strategy, what are you thinking? What can you share with other leaders across the federal government that may have to start thinking about implementing this within their own organization? Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm I'm honored um, for what you've said, and I, I appreciate that. I I think I could I could share what how I approached it um, for the Federal Acquisition Service, if that would address your question. So initially, what I did is I used I leveraged heavily NIST 800-161 as the the overall framework for supply chain risk management plans. Now those on the on the call may know that that's really a guidance document for federal information systems. So when I say I leveraged it, I mean that sincerely. I didn't I didn't use it directly as the only guide because what the Federal Acquisition Service is is not just an information system. So I had to create the framework for the FAST, the Federal Acquisition Service Scrim framework across all of our service offerings, which is acquisition vehicles, assisted acquisition, and what's the other one, Keith? Shared services. So I had to look at all those as our, as our business offerings and then overlay what the NIST 800-161 is. And then I also incorporated elements of CNSSD 505, which was designed to be scrum guidance for national security systems. So I had to think through what that did at national security level and then bring it to a civilian agency level, just in concept. Um, of course, the NIST criticality uh, 8179 was useful as well. So I synthesized that information and then created the FAST organizational level scrim plan 
um, and it, it's really based on the template that's in the back and the appendices of 861, but I adapted it because we're an acquisition service organization. Um, I hope that's helpful uh, for, for those on the phone. The next step from the organizational level plan was a mission level plan. And for FAST, given what we know is happening with the Federal Acquisition Security Council, we prioritized our respond, remove plan. So we finished our respond, remove plan recently and uh, have posted that on our acquisition uh, portal. It basically documents the way that GSA is postured to support additional exclusion and removal orders that would come from the FAST. I promulgated the organizational level plan and the remove plan largely through our Scrim Champions program, which was our foundational awareness level group. And they're really growing into um, professionals across the FAST enterprise that understand Scrum and then can, can articulate what our organizational level plan is and what our remove plan is to their colleagues in the respective business portfolio and region. I also uh, was a foundational proponent of the GSA Scrim Review Board, which is not just for FAST, but is for the agency as a whole. It ha it's interdisciplinary in that we have legal counsel, we have policy people, we have acquisition people, um, we've got our OCIO office represented there, and that's a body where we not only have cross-disciplinary functions, but it also represents all of GSA as an enterprise. And we discuss supply chain risk management questions, particularly related to 889 in that group. And the, the focus is to support our acquisition workforce and to provide transparency across the enterprise about how we're implementing 889. That was perfect. And a couple of things I wanted to highlight is, you know, you mentioned you really leaned into NIST 800-161. And, you know, the, the takeaway from that is, you know, that there's often so many things that we have to consider when we're standing up a supply chain risk management function. Um, but I want to encourage um, anyone listening on this panel is, there's guidance out there. You know, NIST has done a fantastic job to give us a framework that we can sort of adopt and augment to fit our organizations as appropriate. But having that as a starting point will assist you as you continue to move forward. The second thing I want to talk about is the review board and the Scrim Champions, which I think it's probably the most important thing that's been done within our organization. Bring together people that you can educate, empower, and enforce, right? Um, to help you enforce supply chain risk management within your organization. This isn't a space that we can do in silos, right, or with one person being able to, to have champions, which is a great word, to go out and spread the word and see things that we may not have the ability to see from our vantage point is hugely important. Um, so again, thank you for that. I want to pop over to Keith for just a minute, right? Because I look at supply chain risk management like being in a boat on an ocean. And when we think about acquisition, that's our water, right? So we can either drown in the water or that water can help move us to where we need to go. And if we don't have strong acquisition compliance, if we don't have strong acquisition strategy, our ability to move the needle forward in supply chain risk management is going to be hugely hindered. So Keith, if I can ask you, you know, within GSA FAST IT specifically, for acquisition operations, it plays such a huge role in carrying out the regulations, policies, and procedures. What steps are you taking to ensure that supply chain risk management and cybersecurity is addressed in future acquisitions? Thanks, John. Um, you know, as, as we look at cybersecurity and supply chain risk management, 
you know, our, you know, I, I've said this several times in, in presentations where our workforce is, is the core of our business. And in order for us to deliver and provide the IT solutions moving forward, the workforce, we really need to look at, uh, uh, do the proper assessment of our workforce and uh, from an organizational change perspective, look at the people, the process, and the technology that we're using to support cybersecurity and SCRIM. So let's, t let's break this down for our workforce transformation. First, when we look at upskilling and reskilling the workforce, it's really getting the basic understanding of cybersecurity and, and, and supply chain risk management. And GSA FAS is doing a really great job in standing up uh, the awareness uh, uh, training as well as stepping up uh, some of the uh, supply chain risk management training that uh, Kelly Arts has put together. So that, that's a great thing for us to do. The other thing that we're doing within the acquisition um, uh, side of the house is looking at uh, updating position descriptions and looking at how we should posture moving forward as we as we move towards uh, building out uh, the capabilities that we're going to need uh, moving forward. And filling positions and, meet, and, and meeting the current and future mission requirements is also key, right? So our workforce is going to deliver um, uh, the uh, capabilities and acquisition solutions moving forward. So as we, all, as we look at the workforce, but we, we cannot ignore the fact that we also need to look at um, uh, the business processes, the, the business operations processes that we have today. We may, some of it may need to be re-engineered. Some of it may need to uh, adopt um, uh, some technology, some different sets of tools to, to manage the program at large from cradle to grave. And when I say cradle to grave, is you know, first we use tools to identify a risk, and then, you know, there's a whole effort from an operational perspective to um, uh, re remove uh, or respond, remove, and follow through with the whole supply chain risk management through the acquisition portfolio. So um, we, we cannot do one without the other. And then we also look at technology. So tools, to, um, uh, there, there's, tools will evolve. And, and so as we manage the, the um, CSCRM program, um, we hope to uh, leverage the adopt by build mentality, meaning that if, it's a re if, if there's something out there with best practices and something that's solving a solution, we should use it. And um, if, we, if we need to buy something that's commercially available that can work in our um, environment, we should. And lastly is build, if, if there's no other um, way to adopt or buy, then we uh, customize or build uh, downstream. But really, it's um, uh, taking a holistic view of the organization to make sure we're properly uh, set up and ready for for what's coming in. This is going to be a journey moving forward for, for all of us. Perfect. Thank you so much, Keith. Um, you know, so looking at our acquisition workforce and determining training, um, Initially, did you look at sort of a, a skills assessment, gap assessment to figure out where to start? Because some agencies may think, well, what training do I need to look at first? So if you could recommend one training to start with, what would it be? So I think from, from, the, from the very basic is really understanding supply chain risk management. So the in introduction, a, a course of uh, 101, right, so, so that we would be able to explain it, but also not from a um, not from like an IT subject matter expert, maybe from an acquisitions perspective. So if we take the training and, and we adapt it to the work environment so that we would train the workforce on what they need to know, we don't expect our um, contracting officers to become, uh, you, you know, the IT subject matter expert, but what we do need to understand is how do, how do we apply it within, the, with, within that environment. So again, as we look at training, we have to structure training in and around the acquisition domain, if, if that's a um, uh, good word for us to use. But um, really, it's focusing training on specific uh, professional series, right? So if we, we, when we move forward, um, all training is good, but sometimes 
you know, if we get into uh, a higher technical view where it should be left to the subject matter experts, then um, it, it, it causes much confusion. So we definitely need to train and um, uh, perform that skills, the skill gap analysis so that we would be able to um, have that meaningful discussion and also develop those um, business lines so that we would have the right people in the right um, positions to uh, not only um, develop the acquisition solutions but also do the compliance, the certification, validation, et cetera, through its, the, the total IT life cycle. It does. Sense. Perfect. Thank you. So I think this is a good opportunity for me to bounce back a minute to Kelly because I know, Kelly, you've been able to use your forum with the Scrum Champions to, to provide training as well. Can you talk a little bit more about our Scrim Chance program, how it's made up, um, you know, who's a part of that? Are, we, are there just IT people? Are there acquisition? Um, just a little bit of a makeup about that. Yeah, sure. I'm glad to. So I actually um, stole the idea from SafeCode. SafeCode, um, as many of you may know, is a software security um, industry group, and there's, there's others like them. But they had a particular article um, or study that they did on a software security champions um, initiative that um, they had recommended. And I, I just love the idea. And I, I took it um, and adapted it to the Federal Acquisition Service. Um, so I, I can't take credit for the Scrum Champions name. That is definitely somebody else's name that I'm using. I adapted it in that we had the um, HCAs, I'm sorry, the, the assistant commissioners and uh, from every business portfolio and region across the Federal Acquisition Service identify um, a scrim champion to represent their business portfolio and their region in monthly scrim champion summits. So I chair those summits and um, our agenda is basically uh, to increase uh, scrim awareness. Every month we, we talk about an issue related to supply chain risk management. We also bring in speakers from other organizations or from within the Federal Acquisition Service. Uh, we've also, I mean, I can tell you what we've done um, and the speakers, some of them have been very exciting to see how, how Scrum is being implemented today. The, the commissioners, assistant commissioners, initially chose one uh, Scrum champ to represent them based on having um, a level of clearance because we thought that we would be discussing classified information as information began to be shared across agencies as a, as a part of the Federal Acquisition Security Council. But what's, what's really happened as the year has gone by is that they've added additional people uh, to join the, the summit because they, they realize that it's relevant for more than just one person that brings it back to their business portfolio region. So many times we have up to three to five different people from a business portfolio or a region who were present to, to discuss the, the issue, to absorb the information, so that they can go back and share that information with their, um, their colleagues. It's also been helpful to us as a platform to share and um, to share challenges that we've had uh, on handling certain different supply chain risks. It's been a platform for us to share guidance from OGP to the acquisition workforce related to 889 implementation for Part A and for Part B. Uh, it's, it's been a, a success in raising awareness and being a channel for, for supply chain risk information to go to the business portfolios and regions and from the business portfolio and regions back to OPC to try to get some policy guidance when needed. Perfect. Is that yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. So having that forum, Welcome. we're gathering information, we're coming smarter, and there's still an opportunity for us to do more regarding new procurement. So I want to jump back to Keith for just a second. I know ITC is working on several procurements at the moment that's focused on incorporating these new scrim requirements. Could you provide us a little bit more insight on, on to, into those projects that incorporate those requirements right now? 
Sure. So one of the uh, large efforts that we've um, actually have been working on is the second generation IT, and which is still in procurement, so I, I'm not able to share a whole lot. But the foundation of what that uh, uh, procurement vehicle will deliver is a um, increased awareness of supply chain risk management where um, we're, we're no kidding looking at the, the scrim plans, but not only just going through the um, process where the um, contractors are delivering um, uh, commodities and services, but also the follow through. So after they go through a self-certification certification process, there's a compliance piece that we're working on that we will monitor to ensure that um, they are, no kidding, following their scrim plan, et cetera. So as we move through the process and as we build acquisition solutions moving forward, it's going to be an adoption over time, meaning that it's going to be a journey. So this is not a one-size-fits-all but it's, it's the beginning of the efforts of cybersecurity and supply chain risk management coming together and, and um, having those requirements uh, spelled out in, in, in the acquisition vehicle. And so as we move forward with uh, things like second generation IT, which will help um, uh, deliver uh, uh, not, not only the, just the uh, commercial products, but also with, with the with the lens of cyber and scrim will be uh, embedded in the in the uh, requirements, and we will see and evaluate, and we will definitely um, uh, assess as we move forward. So we can make modifications and changes as as uh, you know, as we know, IT never. Uh, uh, stays the same, you know, IT development and IT technology changes, you know, every three to six months, and we will have to continue to monitor and keep up with the different tools that can help us do our jobs, not in a manual way, but more in the leveraging the tools that can um, enhance our capabilities of managing the program. The other thing is, you know, within our GWAX, you know, we've been adding additional language to um, uh, to uh, incorporate the changes that are coming through the National Defense Authorization Act, the NDAAs that have been put out. You, you know, 889 is a good area where um, there's a certain prohibitions, the telecom and, and video surveillance cameras, et cetera. And we continue to see additional um, uh, guidance coming out, and as as the regulations, policies, procedures change, we will change accordingly as well, as, uh, and adopt it, and create and develop language in our acquisition solutions, um, so so that we can not only comply, but we can also um, kind of take that cyber offense perspective, meaning getting getting ahead of it instead of reacting to it. So this is the proactive approach that we're we're trying to do with our acquisition solutions, as well as sending the signal on what we're doing to um, shore up our supply chain risk management moving Thank forward. Thank you so much, Keith. So Lisa, I'll circle back to you because as we continue to move forward with these initiatives, I know from a government-wide perspective, you of course are collecting this information and, and making um, recommendations just on how to improve things with the FASC. I'd like to talk a little bit more about what are the next steps for the FASC, as well as what do you envision the process would look like for the information sharing and collection piece on potential supply chain risk and bad actors? Great, thanks, Sean. Those are, um, those are good questions. I wanted to Actually, I think that where Keith was going is very helpful in terms of, of answering this question. So the, um, the Federal Acquisition Security Council has a couple of uh, priorities. So let me touch on the priority first, and then I want to come back to the process piece. So one of the things that the under the statute, um, which would be the Federal Acquisition Supply Chain Security Act, the Federal Acquisition Security Council was tasked with looking at uh, supply chain risk management, shared services, and common contract solutions. So one of the priorities that's been recently kicked off is uh, focusing on those shared services and common contract solutions. So as part of the Federal Acquisition Security Council, there's obviously GSA, DHS, DOD, and there's a subgroup of members of the council 
that are looking at what are the business needs across the federal enterprise in terms of where, in terms of what's really needed for supply chain risk management. Um, where are there gaps? Where are there uh, needed tools or capabilities? So that over the course of the next several months, there'll be the ability to have a good set of requirements, and I use that term loosely, uh, I'm recognizing that requirements can mean very different things in, in IT and systems environments, but generally the business needs of the federal enterprise, and then how can those uh, gaps be closed? And then working with GSA to be able to say, you know, is this, is this a common contract solution that we need to put in place? Or, or working with uh, OMB to figure out, uh, you know, do we need a shared service for federal departments and agencies and being able to do risk assessment? So that's certainly one of the priorities and next steps for the Federal Acquisition Security Council. Uh, with regards to the process piece, I should have mentioned this earlier, but I am super excited to be able to say finally that we can actually talk about some of the processes that the Federal Acquisition Security Council is going to be following when we're looking at um, information sharing and also recommendations for removal and exclusion orders. And the reason why is because in the beginning of September, we were able to publish to the Federal Register the Federal Acquisition Security Council interim final rule. This rule lays out for the public how the FAC is going to conduct its operations and really be looking at uh, risk information and certainly uh, looking at supply chain risk to the federal enterprise. Within this, and I, and I can post the link maybe to everyone in the chat if that's helpful, but within, the, within this interim final rule, it lays out the, uh, what we're calling sort of the referral procedure, and that is how the FAS may evaluate one or more sources or one or more covered articles uh, against a set of, of publicly listed criteria. So things that the FAS will use to evaluate sources um, include, you know, analyzing available information, considering, and considering some what we call non-exclusive factors because I, we don't want to necessarily um, solely limit the facts to only looking at a set of sub-factors, but things like what is the functionality of the covered articles? What is the security, authenticity, and integrity? What's the ability of the source, meaning sort of the entity, if you will, to produce and deliver the covered article as expected? And covered articles is very broad. The Federal Acquisition Security Council can look at IT. They can look at software, hardware, embedded technology within um, within uh, devices, uh, any of those things could be things that the Federal Acquisition Security Council could look at. But we're looking at it from an, a federal acquisition enterprise-wide perspective. The council um, is not, you know, focusing solely on, on, on one agency's efforts, but what are the implications across the enterprise? And is this something that raises the level of risk that's not acceptable for the federal government to be taking on? And if so, then the FAST has the ability to make a recommendation to those three agency heads, again, the Secretary of Homeland Security, the Secretary of Defense, and the Director of National Intelligence, to make a recommendation to say, we think this should be removed from the federal enterprise and it should be excluded from acquisitions. That, could carry, that can carry a lot of weight. Uh, the ultimate, though, issuing of those actual orders would be done by those three agency heads. The Federal Acquisition Security Council, Council cannot issue an exclusion order or a removal order. That has to be done by those three agencies. I hope that that, out, out, that answers uh, the questions that you asked. But again, I will post the link also in the chat for others to be able to pull down and look at the interim final rule because it is out there and it is talking about the FAST operations. So we're really excited to have that document out. Perfect, thank you so much, Lisa. Kelly, if I could come back to you, um, do you have any advice for other government agencies, sort of just a final thought, um, that are working to stand up their own supply chain risk management programs and capabilities? And if you could briefly touch on CMMC, I know that's another hot topic, same as 889. So you have people that are looking to try to do 889 compliance and also looking at CMMC. So if you could talk a little bit about what we're doing maybe in partnership with DOD in that area as well, please. Sure, thanks, Sean. So um, let me go first to the internal uh, supply chain questions that other agencies um, may have um, on the line, and then we'll go to the CMC issue. So, you know, I mentioned in, the, in an earlier response, I mentioned several of the key foundational documents that were helpful to me 
in synthesizing prior to developing our FAST organizational level scrum plan. So it, if, in my opinion, those documents were, were critical to understanding how to sort through the priorities of what to address. But it, it, if you read all these documents and you try to synthesize them, it, you must also understand your own organization, what your mission is, what your values are, what's critical for the success of your organization, and then a, um, correlate what the criteria are for successful scrum program with where your organization sits, your mission, your greatest risk, and what you want to protect most. So that, that environmental framework that I did for FAST guided me as I attempted to follow the appendix that's available currently in um, NIST 161 and then adapted it based on the other information that I synthesized. So that, that's, that's a picture of how that worked. Um, I do have some good news that Lisa may uh, want to share as well that just as all the good work that she mentioned that the progress that the FASC is making and with our FASC IFR, we're also working on another um, document that may be helpful uh, for those agencies that are working to mature their scrum programs to know where to focus. The, the, the CNSSD 505 document uh, does have a, a tracking spreadsheet that, that came with it when that was created uh, a couple years ago. And that tracking spreadsheet can be helpful if you're looking for a, a checklist sort of approach um, after you've done that early analysis that I mentioned on your organization mission priority and top risk and that synthesizing those core documents. Okay, and let's move uh, to uh, the CMMC. I believe most of the people on the call are going to be familiar with the cybersecurity um, maturity model certification. This is um, something that DOD has developed and um, is incorporating. Um, there's a lot of information available on DOD's website to go into further details. There's some organizations who've also begun to make available on their site uh, language to help both small and large businesses prepare for the requirement. Essentially what uh, DOD did was take uh, a lot of NIST guidance documents as well as other uh, guidance related to cybersecurity, and they uh, sorted it in levels so that it goes from level one to level five. It's level one is basically good cyber hygiene. There's nothing um, magic about what it is to be a level one organization. It is it is cyber hygiene. What the CMMC will do is give requirements from DOD will give requirements about what level of CMMC the organization that wants to do business with them will will need to um, have before they can enter into a contract with DOD for that particular service at whatever tier um, the DOD defines. So uh, from GSA's perspective, what we did was, um, well, we invited Katie Arrington to speak to our scrum champ for one. Uh, so that she could explain it to that uh, body of folks. Uh, Keith Nakasone also uh, provided leadership in developing language for two different sections. Um, I think it was section J and section H uh, to put language around how GSA will support CMMC. And, it, and he used that language in the STARS-3 uh, contract, which many of you may have seen in, um, when, it, when the solicitation hit. It was uh, very well received by Ms. Arrington uh, to show the partnership with GSA and DOD. We also have some language in another uh, solicitation coming out, if it hasn't already come out, uh, that will support um, another part of uh, DOD's maturity in uh, using CMMC um, in the real vendor space. So uh, they're going to be piloting what a certification process looks like for select suppliers, and they, they're offering an opportunity for vendors um, who are selected on that particular IDIQ to participate in a, in a test pilot, which would give lucky suppliers the opportunity to have be partially funded to do some of the, to have some of these third party assessments done on their enterprise so that they would know where they will, where they would rank today 
if um, that certification level. Thank you. Required. Thank you so much, Kelly. Keith, I, I want to give you the last minute. Okay. If you could sort of sum up as scrim requirements mature, do you see a shift in scrim oversight conduct being conducted moving forward? Right. So so as you know, this is a journey and it, I, I just wanted to um, add some additional information to Kelly's um, overview on CMMC. This is this is where I say the journey begins in the acquisition solutions. So uh, it, DOD did the, develop the uh, CMMC um, effort, and we're we're following it very closely, and we're going to be assessing the situation as as things move forward. But um, one of the reasons why we um, uh, adopted some of the language to ensure it was in scope of the STARS three is because we we um, one it's going um, to be one of the best in class vehicles for providing a, a government wide solution. And um, we wanted to ensure that, um, you know, from a level one perspective, cyber hygiene with the NIST 800-53 uh, controls um, are, are part of that as well. So as we move forward, it's going to be a journey. So as Lisa stated, you know, we look at what can be applied at the government-wide, the whole of government approach, right? Because um, we, we, we should adopt some of the controls that are there from a whole of government approach. The other thing is as we look at our acquisition solutions, we want to ensure that we have um, the ability to uh, innovate and inject emerging technologies over time. So, so for example, if, if technology can automate or make changes or have tools that will come out uh, uh, available to support CyberScrim, we want to take advantage of it, right? We don't want to say, oh, this is uh, something that cannot be ad uh, adopted because of um, uh, a scope issue. So we, we're trying to build more flexibility into our major um, IPX so, so that we will be able to move forward as innovations, emerging technologies, and um, as regulations, policies, and procedures change over time. So um, with that, we, we want to ensure we, we have the, um, uh, we raise the awareness of what we're doing within the workforce but also understand where private industry is moving and how they're um, building capability out to provide a better uh, cyber for, for from a whole of government approach. Thank you so much, Keith. You know, I don't I don't know about the rest of you all, but I wish I could take you all and, and just go away for a weekend and continue the conversation. You know, supply chain risk management is just as wide as it is deep, and there's just so many different nuances and considerations that we have to think about as we continue to move the needle forward in developing stronger compliance and reducing risk for the federal government. I cannot thank you all enough for the work that you're doing to, to support all of us, whether you are a, a federal entity or a, a vendor community entity. Thank you so much for your leadership for your work, and most importantly, for taking time this morning to just share some of your insights, some of the practices that you've been able to employ, and really just some considerations for us to think about as we move forward. Larry, I, I want to thank you for having this panel on supply chain risk management and emerging technology and I would like to turn it over to you. I do wish everyone a very pleasant afternoon and we look forward to continuing the conversation soon. Thank you so much, Sean. And thank you also, uh, Kelly, Lisa, and Keith for a uh, highly informative panel. I know that uh, I agree with Sean, we could have gone on for another uh, hour. Um, there's, it, it is such a hot topic and it is so good to hear from these leaders and um, get insight into the role of the uh, Federal Acquisition Security Council and the way that the agencies are working together to address these challenges. So thank you all so much for that. I um, also want to thank our audience for staying with us. At this point, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Alan Hill, the uh, Acting Deputy Assistant Commissioner for Category Management 
in the Office of Information Technology category um, as the Acting Deputy Assistant Commissioner for Category Management. Allen provides executive leadership over a portfolio of acquisition solutions through which customer agencies procure more than $26 billion annually in IT products and services. These solutions include government-wide acquisition contracts, GWACs, uh, such as uh, Alliant 2, our small business GWACs, Vets, and Star, Vets 2 and 8A Stars. Uh, in addition, his portfolio also includes the Enterprise Infrastructure Solutions, and the U.S. Access Shared Services Program. Um, Alan's guidance and oversight of the category teams ensures ITC continues to play a critical role in the administration's IT modernization efforts to drive a more efficient and effective government for the American people. So with that, Alan, I'd like to turn it over to you to wrap up our event this morning. Thank you, Larry, very much. Uh, wow, that was uh, two great panel sessions that we had there. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for taking part in our latest event in this Emerging Technology Series. Um, my name is Ethan Hill. I'm the Acting Director, Acting Deputy Assistant Commissioner for Category Management in the GSA IT category. Uh, as you heard today from several experts in the field of cybersecurity, cloud acquisition, supply chain risk management, and other areas Emerging technology. I want to thank you all participants for, from GSA to DHS CISA, OMB, for sharing uh, their insights and in these exciting topics. Uh, we're glad to see our customer agencies and industry partners uh, working together on meeting the business needs of the government. Uh, think about and using the lessons learned from cloud computing to create an elastic virtual infrastructure, allowing organizations to operate their networks with maximum efficiency and control, using artificial intelligence and machine learning to enhance productivity, automating repetitive tasks, and augmenting our cybersecurity, leveraging the next generation of connectivity, connectivity via 5G, and IoT while being mindful of the unique security considerations they pose. Uh, the benefit of investing in emerging technologies all around, all around us, how cloud computing has transformed network and service architect, offer opportunities for better performance and lower costs. The federal government has increased usage of cloud-based software to promote, promote office collaboration. Uh, today we're using one right now, which is a significant benefit to sustain workflow during this COVID-19 pandemic. AI algorithms make it easier for big data analytics and IoT platforms to provide value to the government, finding trends and opportunities that, will, that were too costly to identify before. Uh, GSA's AI community of practice is working to leverage AI for procurement professionals to reduce the time on repetitive, low-level low level tasks while being able to focus on complex acquisitions and innovation. 5G will provide substantial bandwidth for the next generation of mobile workforce and future applications like smart cities. <clears throat> 5G will also transform wireless carriers operations and facilities to be enhanced services for commercial sector and the government. That's why our work on the national strategy to secure 5G is so important, which is all about facilitating domestic 5G rollout and addressing these risks. These sorts of techno technological advances present new security challenges and considerations to federal agencies looking to acquire these technologies. The primary concern are obstacles for the federal government in adopting these emerging technologies is the potential security risks they can bring to an informational system. In implementing the implementation of these technologies also introduce new threat vectors <clears throat> that our adversaries 
can use to attack the federal networks. These vectors include the use of unsecured smart IoT devices to launch distributed denial of service attacks, more sophisticated phishing attacks powered by AI, and attempts to intercept information transmitted over 5G networks using compromised network infrastructure. As agencies begin acquiring these technology, they want to understand not only how the device impacts their network security posture, but also how their workforce is trained to deploy and utilize the technologies on the network. There are potential risks in implementing any of these technologies, but asking the right questions before or during the procurement process can alleviate these concerns. Government officials should ask targeted questions about the security features and supply chains for emerging technology. In GSA, we have the experts that can help with that. I uh, hope you enjoyed and learned from these things today. Uh, you can email GSA's IT Customer Service Center at itcsc at gsa.gov with any questions, and it will be directed to an expert who can help you. You can also go to gsa.gov slash technology where you can find information on our IT security, telecommunications, and cloud programs. We look forward to working with you. Y'all all have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan, for those closing remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for sharing this morning with us and for participating in our event. Um, this concludes the event for today, and you will receive your CLPs, those who registered and attended, you'll receive your CLPs uh, by end of day tomorrow. Thank you so much. Bye.